Good morning, sisters and brothers, and welcome to First Methodist Church of Rockingham. This is the fourth Sunday of Lent. We are grateful to be able to gather together in person in our beautiful sanctuary. We're also on Facebook Live and WAYN 900 AM and online in all the ways that we gather for worship. We want to do this in spirit and in truth. We want to worship the Lord passionately as he deserves. And we are thankful that we're able to do this. At this time, Miss Helen Alexander will chime in the hour and play a prelude, which will bring us into a more worshipful state of being. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes for our opening word of prayer. Praying in the words of John Wesley from long ago, written in his diary, O Lord, let nothing divert our advance towards you. But in this dangerous labyrinth of the world and the whole course of our pilgrimage here, May your heavenly dictates be our map and your holy life be our guide. And so, Father God, in this time of worship, I pray for my sisters and brothers this prayer. I pray that those who come here needing solace will find that in their time of sadness. I hope for those who come here feeling broken and discouraged that Holy Spirit you will give them courage and comfort as they continue their journey of faith Lord Jesus be very present with us here today oh God we're trying to do our best to worship you as you deserve and so we surrender our hearts our minds our lives before you now in Jesus name Amen 
Our opening hymn is found in the blue hymnal on page 185, When Morning Gilds the Skies. Please stand, if you're able, as we sing this great hymn. is now in our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Testament reading today comes to us from Psalm 107, verses 1 through 3 and 17 through 22. I invite you to join your voices together in the reading of God's holy word. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, 
from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, and let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. Amen. We've come to the time where we'll share our prayer concerns with one another. I have been made aware, and I've already spoke with her this morning. Gaynell Moon uh, is in the hospital. Uh, she had a rough day yesterday and was able to get to the right help at the right time, and she feels some better this morning. Uh, I spoke with her uh, and prayed with her. Uh, before our service began, I think it was around nine this morning when I contacted her. But Gaynell would love to have uh, your prayers lift her up. We continue uh, to remember Cooper and her family, the loss of her brother. What prayer requests do you all have that we might need to lift up now? Joe Ustry. Joe Ustry. Okay. Margaret Brigman's brother, okay. Pam Dillman. Pam Dillman, yes. Bernie Fulp, okay. Chris Hines. Harry and Joel, okay. Steve Kelly. Are there others? Okay. Let's uh, bow our heads and close our eyes for a word of prayer. Imagine that your prayers are drifting up before the throne of God like a sweet-smelling incense. He loves it when his children pray. So let's have just a moment of silence as you offer your prayers. Then I'll lead us in prayer and the Lord's Prayer we'll say together. Let us pray. God, our Father, Jesus Christ, our Savior, Holy Spirit, our Comforter, you are the God of great love. We are told in your word that you are love. Take hold of our hearts and let us sit here in this time of stillness to know your presence as we turn our souls to you. Help us, God, to learn to be still, to discover the mystery of the living Christ within us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Inspire us to turn ourselves inside out in service to you. In the simple things, as we clean our homes, as we commute to our work, as we work in our yards and gardens, as we sit at our desks, as we answer emails and phone calls, may we honor you. As we read to our children and our grandchildren, as we greet our neighbors, as we walk in our neighborhoods and shop in our places where we buy those things that we need. May we honor you at work and at play. Take hold of our hearts, O oh God, and awaken us to the presence of your love. May your love spill over into our lives in such a way that it lightens the path and eases the burdens, not only of our, our lives and those that we love, but each person that we meet. Lord, you've heard the prayer requests, those spoken, those unspoken. We lift them up to you in great faith, knowing that you alone can accomplish what needs to be done, that your will is good and acceptable and perfect. We pray this 
In the name of the one who came as the light and the love of this world, Jesus the Christ, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Our ushers are going to come in just a moment and receive this morning's offering. I want to say a word of thanks to many of you. Uh, Glenn made some announcements last week giving us updates on the many projects that are going on here at First Methodist, one of which is our organ. And I think we reported the other day we, the amount that we needed. Glenn and the uh, trustees and finance, they've done a lot of work trying to make sure that we're able to move forward with this. I think we still need, what, about 18,000? Is that what we're, where we're at? But I think you reported last week it was like 24. So some of you have already given to this, and we appreciate that. Uh, we know how much the music ministry means to us here and to those that watch and listen. And so if you feel inclined to, to give a little extra toward this organ fund, please make a note of that. Let us know or drop by the office and see Cornelia. We'll get that taken care of. But I'm going to claim in faith that we've already got this beaten, that we're going we're gonna to have this repaired. So thank you in advance for your gifts. Ushers, come on.
God, we thank you for your continued faithfulness to us. You provide what we need and often what we want. You are a good father. And as good children, we want to give back to you our tithes, our offerings. We ask, Lord, that you bless these gifts that we've received. Help us, Lord, as a church to have wisdom and discernment, to know how to use these rightly, to build your kingdom up, to bring many sons and daughters to you and the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe it's time for the children to come forward. today. You look good. Well, one of my um, favorite Bible verses begins with, for God so loved the world. And I was thinking about that verse and wondering just how great God's love is, how much he loves us, and how we could measure that. How can we measure God's love? So this morning I brought a few things here. And I thought it might help us measure God's love. So I've got a measuring cup here. Um, sometimes we measure ingredients to make cookies or cake, and we have to measure the milk or the flour or the sugar, and you have to put the right amount in there because it won't taste good if you didn't, did you? So I would use this measuring cup to make sure that I put exactly the right amount of flour, sugar, and milk. But I wonder if we could use a measuring cup to measure God's love. The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. My cup runneth over. And that's in Psalms. Well, if our cup runneth over with God's love, I guess we couldn't use this measuring cup, could we? And then I thought about this. If we were building something to measure the length or the width or the height or different things, I would use this tape measure. But I wonder if we might use a tape measure to measure God's love, because it does go pretty long, this measuring tape. The Bible tells us that God's love is higher than the heavens. If God's love is higher than the heavens, I don't think we could reach it with this tape measure. Do you? I don't think it'll go that far. And what about my watch? We use it to measure time, and I bet there are probably some people in here in the sanctuary this morning who's going to look at their watches to measure how long the pastor's sermon is going to be. <laughs> so they will be watch looking at their watches, and I wonder if we could use my watch to measure how long God's love will last. The Bible tells us that God's love is from everlasting to everlasting. Wow. If God's love is from everlasting to everlasting, I guess we couldn't measure it with my watch, could we? Because it keeps going and going, and I have to charge my watch every night. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And that's John 3, 6, 3, 16. I always wondered how do you measure a love like that? Hmm. And the answer is, we can't measure love that big and that much. We don't need to, but we do need to experience it. My prayer for you today is that you may understand how wide, how long, how high, how deep God's love really is for you and for all of us. May you experience it. Though it is so great, you will never fully understand it. But we need to believe in Jesus, and we need to lift him up with praise and love every day. And I want you to remember that God loves you, every one of you, everyone in here, everyone watching, everyone listening. God loves us so much. Can we remember that? Yes, we can. Let's go to the altar and pray.
Dear God, we thank you for your love, a love so great that you gave your one and only son so that we could have everlasting life. Let us believe in you. Let us sing your praises every day. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Miss Mary. Thank you, children. Y'all have a good time in children's church now. We're moving through the season of Lent. It's a season of discovery together and individually. We are crossing a uh, dry and harsh land, which is called self-examination. We're hopefully asking ourselves, what does it mean to be the children of God? And in particular, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Now, as we understand it, discipleship means that we're students, we're followers of Jesus. Followers of the way. Remember, Jesus referred to himself, the way, the truth, the life. As disciples, we are also called to be leaders. Are you aware of this calling on your life? The day-to-day -day life. As a follower of Jesus, you are also to be a leader. We are to lead others in the path of righteousness for his namesake. That good path, the path of salvation, through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, through God the Father and the Holy Spirit, by the power of Jesus' sacrifice and the indwelling of his Spirit. And in today's sermon text, which I'll get to in just a moment, it refers to Moses, one of the greatest leaders of the Hebrew people, the great prophet of God of whom it was said in Holy Scripture that there has been no other prophet in Israel's history as great as Moses, a man whom God spoke to face to face. What does Jesus want us to know from this reference to Moses in our text today? How does he want us to understand Moses as a leader? And that's what we're here for, to find that out today. Today's sermon text comes from the New Testament. and It's part of the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. You remember he was the leader of the Jews who came at night so that he could question Jesus about how can I be born again? How can I have eternal life? Jesus answers him and then proceeds to tell him how disappointed he is. That often it is the religious people who fail to see the truth, even though it's been taught to them repeatedly. He says to Nicodemus, you are Israel's leader and you don't understand these things. I tell you the truth. I speak of what I know. I testify to what I've seen, but still you people don't accept the testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you don't believe. How will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? And see, we remember Jesus came from heaven and he knew he was going to return to heaven. And then Jesus speaks these words from John chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, reading through verse 21. God, please add your blessing to the reading and the hearing of your word today so that we might understand this. Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he's not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. We should say, thanks be to God. Amen.
Thank you, choir. Beautiful. All right, sisters and brothers, you with me? We got some heavy lifting to do today. If you're with me, say yes. yes. All right. Before I go any further with this task, let's pray. Gracious God, we stand in awe and wonder of you. We are amazed at your love for us, that you would send your only Son to save us, that you would make your word flesh so that you could dwell among us. And we barely begin to understand the magnitude of your love through all the ways that we encounter Jesus in our lives. We want to go deeper into this. We want to understand more, to sense your presence more often. We are grateful, Lord Jesus, that you have said, I'll be your good shepherd. I'll lead you. I'll guide you. I'll care for you. And you are the one who cares for us and knows us by name. We no longer have to be a people who walk in darkness because we've seen Jesus, the great light, to guide our way. We don't have to hunger and thirst anymore for nourishment because Jesus is the bread of life and living water. We find solace in Jesus who comforts us in time of fear and strife through the power of his Holy Spirit. We don't have to live in fear because we know that Jesus has already conquered sin and death and hell. And we live in confidence knowing that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Father, as we seek to be better servants, better Christians, better disciples, we also want to be leaders, leaders of your people and leaders of lost souls into your presence. So as we look at Moses, your servant, one of the patriarchs of the faith, help us today as we contemplate how he was that kind of leader how he got it right for you. Show us how to get it right, how to be powerful and effective and faithful for you in all that we do. We pray this prayer in the name of power, in Jesus' name, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Amen. Amen. All right, so hang on now. I'm going to steer away from the scripture text for just a couple of minutes because uh, as awesome as it is, we need to fade into the past We need to go into the Old Testament. We need to understand a little bit about Moses to set the stage for this. First of all, I will say that Moses was a man who spent time with God. 
And that's the first important thing. If we want to be true disciples, we need to spend time with God. God was very present even in the early events of Moses' life. Surely before Moses was aware of it, we Methodists call that prevenient grace. Prevenient grace of God was there hovering over Moses in his life as his mother showered him in prayer with great faith and found a way to preserve his life by sending him down the Nile in that papyrus basket. His family had great faith in God. And Moses, too, would pick that up and, and exhibit that unshakable faith in a relationship with God. Moses sensed that God was working in his life from a young age. When Moses was still a young man, probably in his late 30s, he had considered what had been offered to him, wealth and power through Egypt being adopted into Pharaoh's family, but he decided that he would be true to himself and to his heritage and to his faith in God. He decided and declared by his actions that he was truly a Hebrew and not an Egyptian, that he would rather suffer with his people than enjoy the pleasure of sin for a short while. That's in Hebrews. Look that up. But that's the decision he made. I would rather suffer than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a short while. When Moses left Egypt, you remember he left in a hurry. He had killed an Egyptian slave guard for sorely mistreating a slave, one of the Hebrew people. And he found himself not long after this in the desert of Horeb. And he was tending sheep for his now father-in-law, Jethro. And for many years, Moses would work as a shepherd. And it was there in the desert of Horeb that one day while tending sheep, he came into the very presence of God burning in a bush, but the bush not being consumed by the flames. And God speaks to him, Moses, Moses, come closer. Take off your sandals. You're standing on holy ground. Whenever we are in the presence of God, we are in holy ground, a holy place. And we need to, to do this reverently. And so there he finds himself face to face with God, God calling him closer, closer and closer, asking for his full attention. And this right here, that begins a conversation with God that would take Moses to places he never imagined and doing things he never imagined anyone could do, let alone that he would be part of the miracles that God had planned to free his people from bondage there in Egypt. Now Moses was about 40 years old when he left Egypt for the wilderness, like I said, late 30s, early 40s. He would spend 40 years in the desert learning his new trade and building his family. He was being prepared for a time where God would use him later in life, when he would lead the multitude of the people around the desert. And these people were stubborn, just like sheep. And a lot of them not too bright, just like sheep. So he learned how to deal with this and those things. Everything that presents us in life can be used for service to God. I want you to understand that. Everything that you've been presented with, it can be used. I think it's interesting to note that Moses was about 80 when he really began the most exciting phase of his life. It was around 80 that Moses was called to go back to Egypt to do the work of freeing the people from slavery. And those of you here who are a little bit more mature in age, you should take heart and hope in that. God might have something huge for you to do in service to Him very soon. Very soon. He may call you into a different phase of life, into a different style or, or uh, kind of ministry for Him. Don't, don't give up on this. If we look at the book of Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, we find that Moses was constantly in God's presence, constantly in prayer, continuing a conversation with God. And the times that Moses and God would talk, they're too numerous for me to list here, but there's one I wanted to point out. One of the best examples, Exodus 33, and here's what we learn. Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, and they called it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise and stand at the entrance to their own tent and watch Moses 
as he entered. And as Moses would enter into the tent, the pillar of cloud, it would come down and stay at the entrance. And the Lord would speak with Moses whenever the people saw this pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they would stand and worship each one at the entrance of their tent. And the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. This is how God would interact with Moses. This is how God can interact with us. You're hardly going to see a place in the Bible where intimacy with God is more expressly put than in that single sentence. Some of the writings of Scripture tell us that Moses and God would spend an extended period of time together alone, as much as 40 days together on top of a mountain. Now that happened twice. Once when Moses received the Ten Commandments from the hand of God, and then again after Moses had broke the original stone tablets out of anger and disgust at what his people had done, how they'd made an idol out of gold while Moses was on the mountain. He would go back and later he would have to chisel those out as God would tell him what to put for that Ten Commandments. Here's the thing. If you want to be close to God, you have to understand it's going to require some time. It's going to require some attention on our part. We must be available to God to be willing to spend that time in conversation with him in quiet times, listening to him speak. And I know most of us don't have 40 days that we can dedicate to this. But you can dedicate at least one day a week, can't you, to come to worship. And I'm going to invite those of you out there who are watching this, come and be with us. Come and be a part of the service with us if you're able to do that. We all must be certain that we are spending more time in the house of God than, than what this country has fallen into. Do you all know that many of the people in our country now consider that one Sunday a month is regular church attendance? One Sunday a month. And no wonder we're in so much trouble. We need to spend more time with God. We need to spend more time with God's people so that we can encourage each other for this life that we're living in. I believe fully that God wants us to be present to him as he speaks to us. And, and yes, he speaks in a lot of ways. He speaks through nature. He speaks through children, through our friends, our neighbors. But are we taking the time to listen, did you come here this morning expecting that God was going to speak to you? I hope so, because that's what needs to happen. You need to come expectantly. Moses was also focused on telling the stories of the wonders of God. He spent so much time with him, he had to talk about him. And when we understand the importance of this, of relating what we know about God to others, then we're doing the work of leading. The first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, are credited to Moses. This is him telling the story. The book of Deuteronomy from chapter to chapter takes us in the retelling of the story of the children of Israel in relation to what God had done for them in his decrees and his laws that were handed down. Now these he's speaking to were the children of the original people of the Exodus. They didn't see many of these wonders firsthand. You remember their mothers and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers had become stubborn and refused to follow God's plan. And so God let them wander around in the desert for 40 years. And he told them, you will not receive the promise, but your children will. And so many of them died off and then their children got to enter the promised land. And I believe that if the original group, if they had fixed their hearts on God, if they had paid attention to what God was telling them, they would have been able to enter the promised land. And it wouldn't have just been for their children. But they had not desired God's presence as they should. Remember we talked about the tent of meeting just a moment ago? Why didn't these people make their way to the tent of the meeting? Why didn't they just stand at their tent? Well, because they were afraid of God in a way. They were fine with Moses entering in. See, they'd hired themselves a professional Christian. And I want you all to be aware, I am not your professional Christian. I will lead you, I will guide you, I will pray for you, I will be there for you, but you have to put some effort into this yourself. I can't, you can't just rely on me. You've got to put some effort in yourself. But that's how they were. They said, oh no, Moses, it's good for you to speak with God, but we don't want to hear God's voice directly. Don't be that way. Moses would constantly take up the task of telling the story 
from one generation to the next generation. And he said these words in Deuteronomy 11, Fix these words of mine in your heart, in your mind. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them to your foreheads. Teach them to your children. Talk about them as you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children will be many in the land that the Lord God has sworn to give your forefathers. Do you see that? Do you see how the stories of God were supposed to be told again and again? The statutes of God were to be handed down when you sit together, when you rise up, when you walk along, when you sit down, when you go to bed at night, when you rise up in the morning. Build these things into your homes and into your gates. The Word of God, the passion of being a part of God's family needs to become so much ingrained to us that we not only tell our children, our grandchildren, but everyone that we encounter. And there's a promise that's attached to that. If you do these things, then your children, well, they'll prosper in the land that God is giving. See, as the children of God, as followers of God, as disciples, we need to be obsessed with telling the story. It's important. And then we come to today's passage. Moses pointed to life and away from death. He pointed to salvation found only in God. That brings us back to that New Testament text and the reference. When the children of Israel had traveled from Mount Hor along the way of the Red Sea, they arrived at a place called Edom. And this is what happened. The people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God. They spoke against Moses. They said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this desert? There's no bread. There's no water. We detest this miserable food. That miserable food was manna, by the way. And the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people. And many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, we've sinned. We spoke against the Lord. We spoke against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away. So Moses went to speak to God and prayed for the people. And the Lord says, make a snake, put it on a pole, and anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. When anyone was bitten by the snake, they looked at the bronze snake and they lived. Now, this to me is one of the most fascinating stories in all of Scripture. God usually does not allow any kind of graven image to be made for fear that people will worship that image. But here, he says, no, this is something you must do. This object in Hebrew is called a nehushen. And let me be clear, this is not an invitation to worship an idol. If you look at what God commanded, you'll notice God did not tell them to worship that bronze snake They were just supposed to look at it. You may be familiar with this bronze snake on a pole. It has extended through all these years to us. It's the sign of a a medical symbol. And it stands for healing. So God didn't say worship the snake. He said look to the snake. And if you look, then you'll live. Now, here's another point. Just looking at that snake, it would save your life but it might not necessarily alleviate the suffering. It allowed you to live. They'd still been bitten. They still had the deadly effects of the venom, but it was neutralized so that it couldn't kill them. And then we come to today's passage. Jesus, in this story, recalls this and talks to Nicodemus and to us and says, remember this. And he compares himself to that bronze snake being lifted up. And don't squirm. Jesus made this himself. This is his comparison. What did he mean by this? The bronze snake is a foreshadowing of Christ. How that snake had to be fixed to a pole and lifted high. And if people looked, then they would live. Christ knew that he himself was going to be affixed to a cross, the center beam of which is a pole. He knew that just as in this story, if people failed to look to him in that way, crucified, they would die of the venomous effects of sin that runs through our bodies. If someone in that camp had been bitten by one of those venomous snakes and they looked anywhere else, 
Well, somebody would be hauling off their dead body very shortly. And so too with Jesus. Salvation is found in no other name under heaven. And salvation is found through the sacrifice. Jesus Christ surrendering to crucifixion, to that death. And if we fail to look to him, we are doomed by the effects of sin. You recall in this passage that we read, he said, if you believe in me, then you are not condemned. And anyone who does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now we know that when we die here, we'll die physically, but we live spiritually forever because we are with Jesus. We know that Jesus will call up our bodies so that flesh and blood can be reunited with our spirit someday, but that body will be different. Just as we said in the funeral the other day, this perishable body has to put on what is imperishable. This mortal body has to put on immortality. And this happens through Jesus. When we look to Jesus and we look to him crucified, and we understand that he is the sacrifice. That is the antidote for our sin-sick souls. And that bronze snake, it was made of ordinary stuff. Bronze was very common to them. It wasn't gold. It wasn't silver. And so too, Jesus came in ordinary stuff. Flesh and blood and bone. He comes to us as the Son of Man and the Son of God. And just like the bronze snake looked like it was a venomous snake... Jesus, being in our likeness, well, he, we would think of him as human completely, but we need to be aware there's no sin, there's no venom in Jesus whatsoever. That's the only way he can take our place because he's sinless. Don't ever let anyone tell you that Jesus Christ was a sinner in any way because that is not true. He was flesh and blood, but different from us. Moses made that snake and lifted it up and the people could be saved from death. And so too, we must lift Christ up. The crucified Christ. I was so happy the choir sang the song that they sang today. It's, it's all about that cross. And as we head through Lent, as we head toward the Passion, as we head toward Good Friday, we need to reflect on this more and more, what Jesus has done for us. And I'm going to tell you, the best that any preacher, any teacher, any Christian can hope to do is simply point to Christ and Him crucified. So, here's your challenge. I want you to try this week to spend more time with God than you did last week. I want you to be in His Word. I want you to pray and listen and sing hymns to Him, offer praise to Him. This will enrich your life and prepare you to tell of the goodness of God to anybody who will stop long enough to hear you. Get used to telling your story. Think about how God has worked in your life. Write it down if you need to. Practice it so that when you come into contact with someone, you can tell how God has saved you and changed your life. People are desperate right now. Do you know that? They are desperate around us. They need to hear your story firsthand. An eyewitness account of the goodness of God. Whatever we do or say, we need to be sure that we point to Christ and lift him up. He's the light that drives away the darkness. He's the only antidote to sin. He is this world's only hope. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is found in the blue hymnal. Page 467. Trust and obey. Please stand if you're able as we sing this hymn.
Amen. Thank you all for coming to worship with us today. I pray that you have a blessed week. From the days of Moses in the wilderness to Jesus' final walk through Jerusalem to here and now, God's desire for us has been and remains the same, that we might respond to the grace and the love of God in faith. So go this week. Live out the love that Christ demonstrated. Lift high the cross. Point out Jesus to those who need to know Him so that you can help them go from death to life. In Jesus' name, amen.